the main topic that I wanted to discuss today is this post from Drew McIntyre, who's, of course, a, a clergy, and I think it's in Western North Carolina. It's either North Carolina or Western North Carolina. He's been a thought leader in Methodism for some time. He and two other guys used to do a podcast back in the day, like five, six, seven years ago. It was the biggest Methodist podcast for a long time. I don't know why they quit, um, but Drew continues to post on Twitter and, and ask big thought questions about Methodism and the Wesleyan heritage. And so he's, he's, he occupy, he's trying to occupy a center space between the, the loony lefties and then the fundamental right, right-leaning people like me. And then um, he says things that, that upset everybody, which is the role of central uh, uh, people. So the one he did this week was, um, let's see, this is three days ago, four days ago. He said, I wonder if the United Methodist Church is experiencing a brain drain similar to what the Lutherans had when many leading scholars left to become Catholic or Orthodox. So I don't know this history of the Lutherans. I trust him that it happened. Um, but yeah, what, what's to be said about this notion? Has there been a brain drain as the United Methodists have um, become so hostile to right-leaning ideology that they have forced out everybody who's not on board with the program. And that has happened, and that was seen most explicitly in, um, oh, heck, what was that bishop? The, the former president of the Council of Bishops, in his opening address to the General Conference, it was get with the program or get out, right? And the, thing, the same thing had been said in various ways in various venues for years, and that's why right-leaning people left. They came to understand that the, the extreme progressive left was not leaving, and they were going to continue to agitate until they got their way. So we left. And the question is, when we left, did the UMC lose out on a lot of really good thought, scholarship, academia, um, otherwise really great mental mind, head, head-based leadership? That's what I understand him to be saying. And so here's, here's the engagement in the comments, and I'll have my own thoughts, but the immediate response is from Susan Robb. No brain drain. A number of brilliant scholars present in the academy and in the churches with young talent continuing to rise. And then, um, here, I'll pull up the different names. And I don't know a lot of these. Mac Alice, Wes Allen. Willimon tweets, though. I immediately kind of get, hmm... Because Will Willimon has published a few things in the last year that lead me to believe that he is losing his mental capacities. He's not a good thinker. He's overly emotional and um, um, uncharitable, not able to understand people who don't agree with him. Uh, Dr. Stephen Long, Ted A. Campbell... Maria Dixon actually did an interview with me and obviously is very intelligent in some ways, but um, is she an academic giant that you need to lead a denomination? I'm not sure she has a, a coherent systematic theology. Um, Tom Berlin, Adam Hamilton, okay, that's, oh. Uh, Allie Hayes Shulman, I don't, I don't know who that is. Marguerite de Vega. To name a few, okay, so these these are the theological giants of United Methodism now, apparently. Um, Drew answered to that, the argument is not about what's remaining, but the significance of what has departed. In particular, I worry we're losing folks to disaffiliation and retirement, whose primary fields are Wesleyan history and theology. So I'm, I'm trying to think, I wish he had named names here, trying to think of names of people who have left the UMC. David Watson, I know. Kevin Watson, I know. Um, I think I think Ryan Danker was United Methodist. Um, who else? Scott Kisker, he's surely not United Methodist anymore. Um, the, pretty much, uh, well... Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, David De Silva, that's another one. I interviewed him a while back. Really, really smart guy. 
Yeah, they've lost, the United Methodist Church has lost a lot of scholars, at least in their affiliation. So we'll, we'll come back to this, but I, I, we'll, we'll read a few more tweets. Um, Susan Robb, the, the person who is pushing back, says, I understand your concern, but I personally know young theologians whose PhD focus is Wesleyan theology and others who are brilliant and on fire about their faith, Wesleyan doctrine and theology. So hopefully, as Julian of Norwich would say, all shall be well. That's my prayer. Um, and of course, everything will be well in the end. That's what I was beginning today's uh, live stream on. But the thing is, when one re uh, refuses to work with God, then one sets oneself at odds with God. And so when the United Methodist Church refuses biblical theology and early Methodist theology and polity and, and ways of exercising authority in the body, then they renounce those blessings from God. Then they separate themselves from God. Of course, they don't see it this way. Um, they see themselves as staying with the true God that there's just a lot of scripture that doesn't fit with. So, um, and it's it's hard to listen to someone say, man, there's a lot of young people who really care about Wesleyan theology. Well, you go, okay, well, that's great. They're reading John Wesley. They 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 care about early Methodism. That is not a safe assumption to draw. There, are, um, Remember, I went to Boston University School of Theology. It's the oldest flagship seminary of the United Methodist Church. Um, I led the Wesleyan club there. Uh, surprise, surprise. And the Wesleyan theology, even the Wesleyan scholars they had in residence there, or the, the the professors that were the designated Wesleyan professors, were not old school Wesleyan, did not have an appreciation for that. To them, Wesleyan just means concerned for the poor, because John Wesley was. That's that's basic. That's basically all they mean by it. They don't have a, a sincere desire to reclaim the Methodist heritage. And so whenever Susan Robb is saying, hey, we got some people up and coming that really care about this stuff, she's not talking about um, she's not talking about the things that, that you and I care about with, with Wesleyanism. So Adam Hamilton gets on board, of course. He was tagged. He says, I agree, Susan. Drew, I'll be grateful for those Wesleyan scholars who will continue to do great work that will serve the entire Wesleyan movement. We've always benefited from Nazarenes and others, but with Susan, I feel confident we have great scholars coming up. And this is just something that, that boomers and older folks do in the church, is they convince themselves that the new generation is so promising that they really don't need to worry. And the United Methodist Church has been doing that since the very beginning. And since the very beginning, the United Methodist Church has been in decline. It's in free fall now. But um, one of the things you have to understand <laughs> when you read your Bible is, you don't pass off to the next generation what needs to be done now. That's why the patriarchs were old when God called them. It's uh, there, there are a lot of people who are feeling like, I did my time, I need to punch my card. It's time for the next generation. Well, listen, if your generation didn't do its job protecting the faith, um, then it's still your job to step up and make it happen now because you have not equipped the next generation. The, the youngest generation in the church is the most effete, ineffective generation in the church. Um, that was probably said too strong. I would say it. it's, it's as ineffective as the previous generation. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can offend everybody. Um, yeah, there, there needs to be, I see no reason to take comfort in this upcoming generation, whether it be in the United Methodist Church or maybe even in the global Methodist Church. I mean, it remains to be seen, right? But I don't, I don't, surely in every generation there have been Wesleyan scholars that were interested in the field, but it was Albert Outler himself, the Wesleyan scholar of his day that crafted the Wesleyan quadrilateral that did so much harm, um, for decades, continues to do harm today. Let's keep going. Uh, Drew says, hopefully we do, and hopefully they are valued by the church. And then, oh, I, I don't know if I'd seen Manas. Uh, this might be new. Uh, monastic Methodist mom. This part I do wonder about. It seems like a lot of our decision-making is removed from serious theological study, debate, and discernment. For example, See the approved social principle, including a strange addition approving the huge bioethical human rights concern, surrogacy. I went to Protestant theology 
of the body conference recently, and there were a lot, were a total of two Methodists present. I think we're neglecting to address important theological things seriously, but I don't think that's about a lack of professional scholars, but weak discipleship. I can't help but agree. I've seen this commenter before. Uh, I don't remember where uh, she she aligns, but yeah, there's there's the academy and scholarship, and then there's just like basic thought. And are the disciples that left the United Methodist Church more thought-oriented than those remaining? I would be inclined to argue that, actually. I think that the United Methodist Church at this point is oriented much more by feelings than thought, by good intentions than by uh, um, uh, any kind of rigorous thought. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to use the same words over and over. But yeah, um, with the social principles, which were supposed to be more biblically aligned and weren't, there's just there's very little evidence that the United Methodist Church is taking the command seriously to love the Lord with all our mind. You know, as Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It seems that they're neglecting the mind for the sake of the heart. Richard Hayduck says, do you think that current UMC leaders would see such a thing currently happening? Uh, the brain drain. What are the signs that you're considering? And Drew says, no, I don't think most United Methodist leaders see anyone who leaves now as a... Uh, no, I think most UMC leaders see anyone who leaves now as a traitor at best and a bigot at worst. I see a loss of a significant number of productive scholars in a short period of time akin to what the ELCA experienced. And then Tiffanita says, this is not what I'm experiencing or hearing from colleagues. <laughs> and I don't know who, I don't know who she is. I don't know who WKB is. You must not be in Texas then. The vitriol is off the charts. And then she says, now that makes sense. I'm in New Mexico and I hope it gives you hope and perspective that not everywhere is a battlefield. So uh, she's, I guess she's saying, uh, I'm not seeing people treat those leaving as traitors and bigots. Um, and then I think that this is an, that's an ad. Yeah, never mind. Um, and then she answers this question, though. Do you think that there's a brain drain? No, not at all. And he says, do you mean that we have not lost any scholarly horsepower sufficient to be concerned about? It seems a fair question, given that about a quarter of U.S. membership is left with millions more in the process and many scholars Perhaps it's not enough to warrant concern, but it isn't nothing. And it's also possible the mainline denominations are so little concerned with their intellectual capacities that the teaching role of its leaders and the teaching role of its leaders that we wouldn't care about a drain anyway. And that's what I was saying just now is the culture of the UMC is now they take themselves seriously academically, but not for good reason. The, the level of academic output put out by United Methodist scholars pales in comparison, or I guess in contrast, to what previous generations were able to do and put out. And in fact, a lot of it I would characterize as intentionally, well, and I don't want to give the impression that I'm just reading tons of United Methodist scholarship, but I just know that a lot of the scholars that were intentionally hired by United Methodist seminaries are not the most rigorous are not the most um, faithful to the tradition of Wesleyanism. They're faithful to the agenda they have gotten with the program. They are on board with the the long march uh, towards our, our brave new future. So um, Tiffanita responds, and again, sorry about that. And again, I think this intentional reading interpretation is unfair. Rather, let's all focus on loving others, serving, bringing justice, reading and studying, and send one another into the world with blessings. All that I take that to say is this line of thinking is making me uncomfortable. I don't like it. And so let's focus on something positive, which, of course, is a natural way for people to think. But this is how people and movements die. They, um, you have to you have to address the concerning things that are happening, and it's just kind of like I don't know how many of you have seen. Um, oh heck, what's the fish movie, the Pixar fish movie, Finding Nemo? 
and you find Dory who has this terrible memory problem and so she learns this song it's like the saddest song just keep swimming just keep swimming just keep swimming swim she just she's 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 not going to remember anything she's not going to learn anything and so you just keep going and that's where the united methodist church is right now it's deer in the headlights <laughs> don't look at the signs around us everything is going bad we're we're doing right just keep swimming that's that's what's happening right now and uh drew responds kindly to her he says that's a lot of things to focus on but i agree in spirit and i argued for a long time a split was needed even if it was painful and then they part in peace um paul roland says personally i don't think there's been much brain for to drain from the umc in recent years or the last decade which is what i was just saying too drew says it's there it just isn't valued by the institution i've been fortunate to study with many serious umc scholars at duke and uts at that point, I would just poke at Drew and say, I, I'm not real impressed with what Duke has been putting out into the world for the last bit. The biggest and most popular thing being the worship of the queer God and their uh, chapel service. So um, I, I'm not sure that, uh, that Duke has been what was needed for this present moment. But Drew, you can uh, publicly disagree with me. I would like to hear you toot the horn of Duke and the, the academic contributions that it has made or the thinkers that it has given to the Wesleyan Methodist world that you think have been needed for this present moment. I'd like to hear that. I haven't heard anyone make that case very well. I, to be honest with you, to be quite frank, there are several official United Methodist seminaries, and I think all of them have been a tremendous waste, and even worse than that, I think that they have been a breeding ground of hostile theology to not just John Wesley and the early people called Methodists, but uh, to Christ himself. I think that I think that, that United Methodist institutions have been committed to the project of how can we disprove historic Christianity and historic Methodism and still call ourselves Methodist? How can we do that project? I think that... Asbury and many other evangelical Wesleyan institutions have been committed to the project of how can we hold on to those things that are true that the lefties are trying to take from us while still being seen as reasonable to the world. I, I, I see that as, as the main project. And then I think that there needs to be an academy that is focused only on the question of how is all of it true? How is all of it true? And so you see that in my recent pushback against Ken Collins, and he was pushing back against biblical literalism. And I was saying, we need to lean into literalism. We need to, or not, no, not literalism. He was saying the uh, inerrancy of Scripture. We need to lean into the inerrancy of Scripture. That's what I would say. We need to focus on all the ways in which it is literally true, metaphorically true, historically true, we need to be focusing only on the project of reclaiming the truth of Scripture. And that's where I'm hoping that the academy in the global Methodist church goes, is we are going to establish the veracity of the Christian Scriptures and the Methodist tradition. We're not interested in making ourselves look more reasonable to the world or um, validating what we can on the left. I I'm not interested in that project whatsoever. So. I think Drew and I would probably disagree on what's most important in the academy. I think most evangelical scholars would be uncomfortable with the degree to which I go um, as to what's needed in the academy. Um, Beth Ann Cook says, I can't imagine that UMC leadership cares. Basically, Bishop Bickerton said that if you agree, disagree with the new direction, get out. And that is, of course, true. Then I love this from Justice Hunter. I don't understand it. I don't understand. I guess it's someone's brain got drained and all that's left is the legs. I really don't know. Um, there were also some, some additional comments, but I, I see that I've already gone long. So I need to finish up my comments on this. Um, I think I'll publish this later today. And the thing I want to say about this is the United Methodist Church has, yes, been losing out on scholarship for a long time as it has let its um, uh, seminaries get compromised by worldly ideology. Um, 
even you know going back to the days of Boston personalism and Borden Parker Bowne, that which was like the high point of uh, liberal academic work in in Methodism. Even that wasn't very impressive. Like I went back whenever I was at Boston University and tried to read Borden Parker Bowne, and from what I could tell, there's not much there there. He was just in with the spirit of the age, so they they buttressed him and acted like what he said was great. But I I maybe it was lost on me. I don't know. Liberal theology never impressed me. It's always seemed very loose and flaccid and self-aggrandizing. It doesn't maintain at all the standards set by predecessors. Um, now that said, there is this two kooky thing, which is, uh, well, okay, you're not so great either. And what scholars does the global Methodist church have? You know, and we have a few, David Watson. Um, I think, I think that David, yeah, I'm pretty sure David, uh, De Silva has aligned, but there are a lot who've left the UMC, but they haven't aligned with the UMC. I think Kevin Watson, he is aligned with the GMC, I think. But I think he's tied to a church that is not joining. And so I don't know if he's going to maintain his status in the GMC or not, which makes me sad. He's a great scholar. Uh, Ryan Denker, Anglican. Uh, I, there, there are several others that are going in different directions, even at Wesley Biblical Seminary, which I love. Okay, they've got Andy Miller, who's GMC, but then many of their, uh, their guys are associated with the Church of the Nazarene. So the thing is that, there, there are different scholars that are a benefit. Vic Reasoner is not United Methodist. He's not, he's not GMC either. So will the GMC be able to be a body that eventually academics and Wesleyanism gravitate to? I would like to think so. I don't see much reason for assuming that that will happen right now. Um, I would be kind of interested in a breakdown. I don't know if anybody's done this of like where who the different Wesleyan scholars are and what denominational bodies they're affiliated with, if any. So if anybody's done that work, uh, I would love to see it because that is very relevant to this particular picture. Now, that's not to say that just because someone has the academy with them that they're great. Um, there are many people, uh, Julius Dotson, the main one I always point to, Junius, Junius Dotson, former head of discipleship ministries for the UMC, noted that... Um, when the academy became prerequisite for becoming clergy, that is when you see the decline of the denomination. And so I think there is something to be said for once a movement takes itself academically too seriously, they detach themselves from the people they're trying to minister to and become somewhat irrelevant. So I, I'm not an anti-intellectual per se, and I, I, I enjoy reading academic work, and I've appreciated it in time. But to imagine that this is near the most important question, and I'm not hearing Drew McIntyre say that. I, I wouldn't put those words in his mouth. But I'm not, sure, I'm not sure how important it is that I know Methodism for a long time has seen itself as academically important. I'm not sure it needs to be, especially if we keep getting sucked into these conversations about how is the Bible not true? How do we not need it to be true? Where, where can we not insist that it be true? Like these conversations I don't think are helpful. So if that's the direction that the academy continues to go in, I guess I'm okay losing the academy. And maybe United Methodist Church, maybe you should be too. Um, I'm much more concerned just about the critical thinking skills of basic pastors and laity in charge of congregations. And it's in that sense that I really am concerned about the United Methodist Church. I, I'm not sure the academy matters, but I think it really matters when... United Methodist Church leadership is uh, not able to discern that using coercive power is against Jesus, or that um, their biblical hermeneutic is incoherent, self-justifying, and bad, you know, and that laity, for the most part, not for the most part, many laity seem unwilling or unable to make integrity decisions about their affiliation because they're emotionally tied to their congregation rather than than to Jesus, who requires purity and fidelity. So those are hard words, and I, I mean those hard words. I, I wish I could say them in a spirit of gentleness, but hopefully the global Methodist church to which I've tethered myself has more critical thinking, has more discernment than the tribe we left, and that remains to be seen. So 
we should pray for the global Methodist church. 